Good morning. Welcome to Central. Be blessed with our worship service this morning. Come right in. Welcome, friends, to our worship on the first Sunday after Pentecost. My liturgically sophisticated friends will know that the color for this Sunday should actually be white, but I love my red stole and we kind of missed the red altar uh, decorations last week, so we are going to continue with the color red um, during this service. This is also Peace with Justice Sunday in the United Methodist Church, which seems very appropriate given all that is happening in our world. So let us prepare to worship God. Let us join together in our unison opening prayer. You are one, O God, and you are three. You are majesty and mystery. Make us ever in your image, we pray. Make us one, make us we. Amen. This morning for our children's time, I've been thinking a lot about what's going on in the world. There's strive and there's stress and people are angry. And it's a time that we turn to also listen to the words of Martin Luther King. So today I'd like to share a story called Martin's Big Words. And it goes like this. Everywhere in Martin's hometown, he saw the signs, white only. His mother said these signs were in all southern cities and towns in the United States. Every time Martin read the words, he felt bad until he remembered what his mother told him. You are as good as anyone. In church, Martin sang hymns. He read from the Bible. He listened to his father preach. These words made him feel good. When I grow up, I'm going to get big words, too. Martin grew up. He became a minister like his father, and he used the big words and he, as he, he heard as a child from his parents and from the Bible. Everyone can be great. He 
He studied the teachings of Mohammed Gandhi. He learned how the Indian nation won freedom without ever firing a gun. Martin said love when others said hate. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. He said together when others said separate. He said peace when others said war. Sooner or later, all the people of the world will have to discover a way to live together. In 1955, that's a long time ago, on a cold December day in Montgomery, Alabama, Rosa Parks was coming home from work. A white man told her to get up from her seat on the bus so he could sit. She said no and was arrested. Montgomery's black citizens learned of her arrest. It made them angry. They decided not to ride the buses until they could sit anywhere they wanted. For 381 days, they walked to work and school and church. They walked in rain and cold and blistering heat. Martin walked with them and talked with them and sang with them and prayed with them until the white city leaders had to agree that they could sit anywhere they wanted. When the history books are written, someone will say, there lived black people who had the courage to stand up for their rights. In the next 10 years, black Americans all over the South protested for equal rights. Martin walked with them and talked with them and sang with them and prayed with them. White ministers told them to stop. Mayors and governors and police chiefs and judges ordered them to stop. But they kept on marching. Wait. For years I have heard the word, wait. We have waited more than 340 years for our rights. They were jailed and beaten and murdered, but they kept on marching. Some black Americans wanted to fight back with their fist. Martin convinced them not to by reminding them of the power of love. Love is the key to the problems of the world. Many white senator, Southerners hated and feared Martin's words. A few threatened to kill him and his family. His house was bombed. His brother's house was bombed, but he refused to stop. Remember, if I am stopped, this movement will not be stopped because God is with this movement. The marchers continued. More and more Americans listened to Martin's words. He shared his dreams and filled them with hope. I have a dream that one day in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. Dr. Martin Luther King cared about all Americans. He cared about people all over the world, and people all over the world admired him. In 1964, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. Martin went wherever people needed help. In April 1968, he went to Memphis, Tennessee. He went to help garbage collectors who were on strike. He walked with them and he talked with them and sang with them and prayed with them. On his second day there, he was shot. He died. His big words are alive for us today. And so as I end this story, Martin Luther King's words are alive today with all of us, with people who are protesting here in Stockton, people who are protesting in other cities around the world. May we all hear Martin's words and may we hear those words of our protesters today. Amen. Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. 
God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Humankind, he created them. Our next reading is from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to, and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. This is the word of life. Thanks be to God. On the coffin of a female for repartee, on the lonely passasail of a star, on the of all of our hearts together will be wholly acceptable in your sight. We pray in the name of Jesus, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Friends, this has been a very tough season in the life of our community, our country, and our world. And I invite you to think with me about today's scripture readings in light of our reality. An ongoing pandemic, 
anger, frustration, and grief at the continued deaths of black men and boys in particular, families confined in cages at our borders. Suffering is all around us. From the long Old Testament reading assigned for today, I selected only a brief section, God's creation of humanity. In this story, Adam, a Hebrew noun which means the human, is created on the sixth day of creation. Note that we share this day with cattle and other animals. It is not uniquely our day. According to the text, God created humanity, us, in God's own image, male and female. No part of humanity is exempted from God's image. And because we humans come in many shapes and sizes, many skin hues, with many histories and languages and cultures, God's image is beautifully diverse. We are not the same, but we are all created in God's image, every one of us. Western Christianity includes a long history of focusing on individuals, just as Western capitalism applauds the idea of self-made people and individual effort. And I suggest that this focus misses a main message of the Bible, that God's very self is relational, and that God's aim is to engage with people and to have people engage with each other. Covenant is a key concept in the Bible, and covenant involves relationship. Family imagery for God's relationship with humans reinforces the closeness that God desires with people and the closeness God desires us to have with each other. Treat the foreigner in your midst as a citizen, for once you were strangers in Egypt. We find that command in the Torah. When startled disciples asked Jesus when they had ever ignored him, he said, any time you pass by somebody in need and do not respond, you have ignored me. Jesus built a community of disciples and empowered them to continue his work, God's work, in the world. We have much to do. Two years ago, Jan R. and I and some friends participated in a Black Lives Matter march in Des Moines, Iowa. White people were involved, but not to lead. We were asked to walk alongside the outside of the marchers, providing some protection for the people of color walking in the middle. The march was peaceful. A few weeks later, one of my brand new first year college students asked me, why were you at a Black Lives Matter march? Don't all lives matter? His experience was limited. Yes, all lives matter, but when one part of the community is suffering greatly, the focus is specific. As a pastoral colleague points out, when a parent requests prayers for a sick child, the pastor doesn't respond, but all children need prayers. We gladly pray for that particular child and a specific need. When black people in the U.S. are dying in great numbers, very disproportionate numbers from the COVID-19 virus, and dying in very disproportionate numbers during encounters with police, the message needs to be loud and clear. Black lives matter. If we don't require ourselves as followers of Jesus to acknowledge the sacred worth of black lives, then we are falling short of the gospel. Our world, our church, our community is diminished when the talents and contributions of any members are devalued. In 1998, 22 years ago, Central United Methodist Church voted to become a reconciling congregation to ensure that the door, church's doors, hearts, and minds celebrate the sacred worth of all people. A specific focus was on the inclusion of the LGBT community because at that time, and still, 
LGBTQ folks were systematically denied leadership positions in the church. But reconciling congregations are about justice and inclusion for all, and there is clearly an intersection between racial justice and gender justice and sexual identity and orientation justice. Jesus was executed by the Roman state in part because he challenged the culture of domination that existed in his time. A large percent of the population was marginalized because of poverty, because of profession, because of physical or mental challenges. The social stratification that we experience today is not so different from that of Jesus' time. And Jesus broke the rules. He ate with people considered unclean. He interacted with Gentiles, though sometimes people had to call him to account before he did. He broke the generational rules by welcoming children into public spaces. He interacted with Pharisees and lepers and tax collectors and women. He kept company with a diverse group of people. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus instructs his disciples to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the triune God, here Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I don't think he is talking about individual personal relationships. Discipleship as Jesus modeled it involves interaction with the world. Disciples are to feed the hungry, cast out demons, comfort the sick, and bring good news. And for some right now, discipleship means taking to the streets to protest loudly but peacefully and to make it clear that we believe all people deserve dignity and respect. That we who are white acknowledge the great amount of unearned privilege we enjoy, systemic privilege. The system is rigged in our favor. We can help to undo that system, but we only do so when we relinquish some of our power. I don't spend much time at all thinking about my whiteness, because I don't have to. But every black and brown person I've spoken to in the last week is very aware of their race. And often that awareness is a survival skill. Almost every black parent I know has talked with their sons in particular about how to behave when, not if, stopped by the police. Jan and I never had that conversation with our children. I benefit every day from white privilege. I am committed to leveraging my privilege where I can to effect change in the system. Racism is sin because racism separates us from God and from each other. And if I can't recognize deep in my being that you are created in God's image, whether you look like me or not, then I've failed to grasp the glorious nature of God. Friends, I pray that Central is a place where we will have the hard conversations about race, about racism, where we can stop pretending that we are colorblind. Nobody is colorblind. Our skin hue is part of who we are. We need not hide it, downplay it, or be ashamed of it. When God sent Jesus into the world, Jesus came as a brown-skinned male, a very particular body in a very particular culture. The point is that God chooses to enter human community and we are all the image of God. Jesus expected his disciples to honor and celebrate God's image in every person, and I believe expects us to do the same. So let us pray for the courage and the will to support and challenge each other as we continue to grow in grace, that we might reflect God's love in a hurting world. Amen.
Friends, we come to the time in our service where we worship with our tithes and our offerings. We are dedicating today offerings which have come to us through the mail. We also have, as many of you know, an online giving option. Today, we also participate in our denomination's special Peace with Justice offering. And online, there is an option for you to specify what, how you would like your offering to be directed. So let us worship God with our tithes and offerings. Our God, with these offerings, we bring ourselves. We come to this table in preparation for communion to prepare ourselves to be your ministers in the world. And as Jesus sent out his disciples long ago to carry on his work, we come so that we may be prepared to minister in our hurting world today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We come to that time when I invite you at home to gather, if you haven't already, the elements that you will be using for your communion. And all of the elements, these here on the altar and those at home, I will bless as we share in this communion celebration. We remember that on the very night Jesus was betrayed by one of his own disciples, he took bread and he broke it and he blessed it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, all of you. This is my body, broken for you. And in this day in particular, we remember the broken bodies and commit ourselves to healing in the world. And likewise, after supper, Jesus took one of the cups of the Passover and he blessed it and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this cup, all of you, for this is the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink this, remember me. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, pour your healing Holy Spirit upon these simple gifts of bread and the common cup and upon the gifts we have in our homes so that as we share this meal, we may understand again that we are one with you and one with each other and one with all the world. May this bread and this cup become for us the real participation in the life and love of Christ. Amen. Friends, I invite you now to serve each other at home, or if you are home by yourself, to serve yourself by taking a piece of what represents your bread and drinking from the cup of the beverage that you have chosen for this day's communion. Feed on your hearts with faith and thanksgiving. Okay. Please join me in the prayer after receiving. You have given yourself to us, O oh God. Your love has filled our hearts. As a people of love, we serve you with joy. Amen. Go forth now, my friends, to love and serve all whom you meet in the name and with the power of Jesus Christ. Go in peace. Amen.
Friends, thank you for worshiping with us today. Next Sunday, June 14th, we will be celebrating with our high school graduates, and we will hear briefly from each of them in addition to a service that that acknowledges the joy we have with them. And we also, of course, will acknowledge Father's Day next Sunday. So I hope you will join us again.